this video will include quotes from the people who knew Edie Sedgwick, taken from the book Girl on Fire by Melissa Painter and David Weissman. Edie seemed born yesterday. She seemed very bright and very eager for life, for the things of the mind and the things of the heart, and seemed like a fresh, joyous creature, experiencing life for the first time. Donald Lyons. She really was lovely. She needed no makeup. She had a marvelous coloring of wonderful pale skin and very dark hair and eyes. Bartle Bull. The first time I remember talking to her at any length was out at Ed Hood's and there was some kind of party going on and she and I sat on the floor at the end of a tiny little hall and talked. I just remember that there was this young woman who seemed to me very exotic, very fragile, and she talked a little bit about having just gotten out of the funny farm, which was, I think, the term she used for Silver Hill. I noted someplace else in a journal that the word she used for crazy was cuckoo, and I think it's somewhat telling because it's sort of little girl vocabulary, and it's a way, I think, of putting aside a judgment about how serious her own mental state might have been. But she talked a little bit about Silver Hill, and for some reason or another, the conversation became rapidly quite intimate, but I think that was her naivete at that point. Innocence is a better word than naivete. About what Edie was like at that point after she hadn't been so very many places. Gordon Baldwin. I first met Edie in the middle of September in 1963 at Harvard. That day, I had a date scheduled with a really lovely girl. A picnic in my favorite place, which was the cemetery on the Charles River, the Charles Cemetery. And the girl never showed up. She stood me up. And so I had this beautiful picnic in the back of my car. I had some wonderful French pâté, and I had fresh daiquiris and a bottle of German white wine. I think it was Mosel Blumchen. So that evening, I was in a nightclub called the Casablanca, and I saw a friend of mine with this stunning girl. So I went over to say hello, and when he got up to get some cigarettes, I said, excuse me, would you like to have a picnic tomorrow? And so we made a date for the next day, had a fantastic picnic for two or three hours, and I saw her every day after that. Bartle Bull. She just seemed crazy. She was very wild and very expressive. Chase Mellon. They were the smartest, classiest, brightest, best looking crowd in Cambridge. That was the A-list. Danny Fields. I was thinking of how when I went to Cambridge after I'd gotten out of two years of hospitals where my parents had me committed, I went to Cambridge and I started going out a lot and then I never came back at night at all. I was out with different men every night practically and my younger sister and youngest brother tried to get me committed to McLean's for my bad behavior. They thought I was really being terrible, but I didn't go. Edie. When I was in the hospital, I was very suicidal in a kind of blind way. I was starving to death, and just because I didn't want to turn out like my family showed me, you know, that's all I ever saw of people was my own family. I wasn't allowed to associate with anyone. Oh God, so I didn't want to live. My mother denies to this day that one of my brother's suicides was suicide, and it's on hospital and police records as suicide. She certainly didn't think she was any sicker than her father, Fuzzy, or the mother, and she thought Fuzzy was a control freak that had ruined the brothers and sisters, and she was the only one strong enough to fight him. She used to steal his Porsche when she was 14 and drive down the coast highway in California. Rebellious, right? The others wouldn't dream of it. She was the only one who did, and there was a constant idea that when she turned 21, they were really going to have to get the doctors to try and commit her. Chuck Lyme. I guess the thing was, Eddie was wanted to talk about the cosmos and the whole picture all the time. It was kind of a dream. It's kind of like psychedelics without the psychedelics. She was very like, talk about the planets and the stars, but I mean as a world, not as look at the pretty stars. She had a kind of worldview of her own. She evidently had spent a lot of time thinking where she'd been institutionalized, and that was, I guess, a way of dealing with it to be in the cosmos and think about yourself as part of that rather than this particularly ratty situation on the physical plane. Chuck Wine. She had this double life in Cambridge. She had this clubby life, you know, the guys that were in the clubs and I didn't have anything to do with that world so I never really saw. 
She hung out with them, but I think she got very bored with them very quickly, and I saw her more at the places that I went to. And after the Casablanca closed, everyone would go over to Ed Hood's apartment, kind of a cross-section of people. She would show up there all the time. Chase Mellon. Edie wasn't around all the time. She would sort of disappear. Whether she disappeared into the studio or somewhere else, I don't know. I think it is possible there was a romantic involvement, but I didn't know about it. Gordon Baldwin. Occasionally, she seemed very fragile and uncertain. She wasn't consistent. One evening, I'd be the right kind of person for her to see. Then another evening, she'd go and do something else. One day, she'd want to paint and work forever. A week later, she wouldn't. She was obviously not yet settled in herself. She didn't know which way to jump with her day or her life. Bartle Bull. Yes, I think Edie was looking for a new family in Cambridge, and I don't feel that we let her down. It was her Santa Barbara and New York families that let her down. Ed Hennessy. It was clear she was not meant for the plan, if that was it. Chase Mellon. Their kids were their subjects. They weren't their kids. They weren't their kids, I mean, as we know kids. I mean, it's funny. In my growing up, my, father, my mother and father were distant parents, but they were parents, and you always felt safe, and you always felt supported, and these kids couldn't have felt safe for an instant. What was going to jump on them next from behind? Harry Dwight Sedgwick. I always thought Edie wanted to escape on her horse, but she couldn't get off the ranch. She was penned in. Usually it started with a battle with my father. She always felt that he would come and get her, so she could only run away on the ranch. She would just disappear into the mountains with her horse, Chubb, and you never knew where she was. Then she'd come back, mellowed out. One of the reasons I think she liked the sculpting lessons and all that was that she could say to the mother, look, I'm doing what Fuzzy does, Chuck Wine. It's a great big thing, a good sculpture. He made a Christ on the cross, that's him, and gave it to the mission in Mexico. He was actually a brilliant sculptor when he began with portrait busts. He was really good at that, but he went wild on the way to success. He was all sold on being famous and recognized in his lifetime, and as a result, he just ran through his talent and wasted it. Edie on her father. It is, of course, very significant that the sculpture, the famous sculpture, was of a horse because that's what Duke sculpted. What kind of competition is that that she was setting up with her father? Gordon Baldwin. He was a complicated and complicating influence in her life. She admired, for example, his artistic energy. She admired his individuality. She admired the fact that he was his own man and nobody influenced him. But she also knew that there was a dangerous, decadent side to him. And indeed, that attracted her to other people later in her life, the people who were witty but corrupt, artistic but corrupt. In some ways, I think Edie was ultimately unknowable. One didn't see where her motivation sprang from. It was hard to know about what she might want to do, but she wanted to be amused, that's for sure. She liked having lots of things happening. She giggled a lot. Gordon Baldwin. She had good manners, although she broke them more often than she used them. But you know, she knew how to be polite. Chase Mellon. She was really living day by day, largely, and that also explains why she got into that wild world in New York. I don't think she was on a very clear path, but she had many talents and a complicated background and not a very driven sense of the future, but just a lot of abilities and enthusiasms. She was tired of being pawed by men. Well, boys is more like it. One of the main reasons Edie felt comfortable around gay boys like me was that we weren't going to bother her sexually. Besides, we were more amusing. Ed Hennessy. There was always about Edie a certain spiritual quality, a certain ethereal quality. Edie was not a young girl in search of a boyfriend. Edie was not Elizabeth Bennet, though she would have been a very nice Jane Austen character. She was a flighty, darty sort, more like a Greek nymph than a winning bride. Donald Lyons. A flirt, yes. A seductress, no. Her flirtatiousness, I would say, was not specific. When I think of someone being seductive, it's directed towards one person. Edie was conscious of being very attractive, but I never saw her put the moves on a specific person, so I don't think of her as a seductress. But I'm not sure that I was ever around anybody that she specifically wanted to seduce. She thought, quite rightly, that her family was grooming her for a good marriage. She was expected to meet one of her brother Jonathan's rich friends in the Porcelain, fall in love, and get married. Ed Hennessy. 
Edie would say, oh, there's that guy. He really means well, but he's such a pill, but I don't want to hurt his feelings, and he's a friend of my brother John's, and he keeps wanting to take me out. Chuck wine. Drink, drink, more drink, everybody drink. Geese, geese, drink. Edie. She seemed snappy, kind of. She was quick. She was alert. She was quick on the uptake. Do you know what I mean? Chase Mellon. She knew a lot of different fascinating people, and they were interesting not because they were famous or rich, but because they were interesting people. Chase Mellon. Edie was very smart, you know, too smart, because she came from such an insular place, she had an interesting commentary on what went by, because she saw it like it was, rather than in some social context like we would. Everyone was very interested in conversations. They had things to say to each other, and that was a medium by which you could express yourself and learn and give and take. It was just for its own sake, so I don't know if that's a salon tradition, but I suspect it is. It's interesting because there's no record of that. You know, you leave no record of it, so there's a kind of purity. It's like some zen activity. Chase Mellon. We wanted to make such a production. The party was at the Harvard Boathouse. Edie danced divinely. Oh God, everyone wanted to dance with her. She changed dresses three times during the evening. That confused a lot of people. Do you think someone spilled a drink on her? Then she'd be in another dress. Oh my goodness, she must have some very drunk friends. How re resourceful to have extra dresses on hand if one gets spilled on. Oh, she was something. She was something different in Cambridge, Ed Hennessy. She's 21. It's like, can she prevail to keep herself from Fuzzy shutting her away again? She was fearful. She had total fear of Fuzzy's maniacal approach. How to somehow prevail against Fuzzy locking her up again? That was entirely it. Chuck Wine. The word winsome comes to mind, that elegant, slim figure on the tabletop. It seemed so purely Fitzgeraldian. That's what made it glamorous. Gordon Baldwin. We were all in a tent. People were drinking, partying, whatever, and suddenly I hear people saying, Edie Sedgwick is outside the tent. So I sort of wandered over, looked out, and she was out in this field and kind of dancing, moving in her own world. I remember feeling, wondering, if, as if she was as out of it as she was appearing, or if it was part of the performance, because it certainly was an in thing right then. It was like the next step to being daring was to almost be a little crazy. We weren't yet at the period where it felt terrible and tragic. It was much more of a, wow, she's so cool, she's so daring to go near the edge. It was still the early 60s, and we were breaking out, and she seemed to be leading the pack. As I remember, she had on a white dress or a white shirt. You saw her in the light, in the moonlight, you know, and she was turning, almost flickering. Robin Sedgwick. Edie had disappeared. It was a bit spooky. Somebody said we saw her go swimming. She was nowhere in sight on this beach. Then somebody else said, is that her, way, way out? Edie was way out, a little dark head, such a distance. She seemed to be going under and then surfacing again. I could see the shine of her legs as she dove. It was like her dancing the night before. She was playing, totally natural and involved in the element of water. She was like a porpoise. She seemed only to exist freely in atmospheres that were removed or enchanted. Most people are happy swimming by the shore, but she was happy out there. John Anthony Walker. After a year, I decided I was going to New York to see what was really going on in the world, Edie. She came to New York as the darling of Cambridge, and these were all rich kids. What she learned of New York then, I don't know. She learned how to use the telephone and how to fill ashtrays with cigarettes and steal jars of Listerine. Get any fields. It was 1964, the president's dead, the Beatles are coming, and something was in the air. Danny Fields. Things were crossing lines so fast back then. The world was wide open at that time, and New York intellectual slash art slash social combination was, once you got in the room, you would just go from room to room to room to room. I remember talking with her frequently on 63rd Street in the mornings, for example, about where in the world we would like to go, who we would like to know, that sort of thing, mainly conversations involving utopias. She was a creature that wanted to live in utopia, as did we all. Utopia was a big house with lots of closets for Edie, lots of books for me, that sort of thing. That was something about the early 60s that impelled us to fantasy worlds. Donald Lyons. It's not that I'm rebelling, it's that I'm just trying to find another way, Edie. 
she has artistic talent drawing these horses that she drew and you'd go look at that spirit in that that's her the muscular freedom of that drawing and in so many ways she felt like a cult like a wild cult so the fact that she could draw that was like oh self-portraits interesting great lm kit carson Edie was romantic in a kind of like almost a classical way like an english country way but not gushy her sculpture was never sentimental if she did animals she got the real animal chuck wine Edie's style was an absolutely perfect self-realization of her art form of herself without trying to be this or that there's an eternal quality to that look that she created she painted her eyelids with watercolor bb hansen the colors oh i see the most fantastic things do you realize when people just close their eyes what they see? It's unbelievable. Colors and things, forms of every sort. I wonder if that happens for everybody. Edie. She wanted to learn things. She picked up things. She was a vibration, and she would pick up on the vibrations and the meanings of things. Donald Lyons. I gave her a history of the ancient world. I don't think I actually read it myself, but I think she did. She was incredibly absorbing and retentive, and it all came fresh to her. It had no context. Ancient Iraq or Rome, you know, it might have been last week in New Jersey, but it had the force of a life she didn't know. You got the impression that the creature, that Edie, was made literally by Zeus three weeks ago, that there was no past to her, save what she picked up from books and people. With her, there was no traditional structure, no formal structure. She would compare Raymond Chandler or Jane Austen or ancient Rome to what she experienced last night with the tuna fish, but it was marvelous and fresh. Donald Lyons. That is unusual to look like you had just walked out of a fairy tale. She had nothing human about her, just mystery. Ivy Nicholson. I think Edie's creation of her persona, of her image, was her art form. B.B. Hansen. Saints are always vulnerable because they are sacrificial, so I suppose there was that implicit in her that she was sacrificial. She was so extremely magical that she was evanescent. She was there and not there at the same time. L.M. Kit Carson. I lived a very isolated life. When you start at 20, you have a lot of nonsense to work out of your system. Edie. The factory was the great electromagnet at the center of all these runaways or displaced people or people going through a generational change. Danny Fields. The silver factory was like being inside a silver lined box. It was fascinating. Ivy Nicholson. I never went there. I think they were confusing talent with decadence. Bartle Bull. I remember Andy Warhol sitting on the couch smoking and people would come over and go down on one knee and say, shall I shoot this from over here? And he'd go, yes, and they'd go away again. It was like a royal court. It was his fiefdom, just as the ranch had been her father's, and everyone there served to bear him up. I think it must have felt very familiar for her. Robin Sedgwick. The factory was very much like a European court. It was everyone for themselves, and no one knew what the other was doing because everyone was very jealous of their role. I think a court is like that, where each person is their own state, two people are a cabal, and three people are a conspiracy. Rene Ricard. The whole space was silvery, painted silver, aluminum, even the windows. You also had on the ceiling a mirror ball, like in the discotheque, and it functioned like a gigantic mirror, and we could look in the mirror all the time and see who we were or who we wanted to be. Ultraviolet. I was kind of turned off for the time being, going out with men, because I was very upset that two of my brothers had committed suicide, two that I love very much. It kind of screwed up my head, so I just freaked out for a while. Edie. And Andy said, what do you think of Edie? And I said, oh, she looks like a downtown poetess. And he liked that. And he said, really? And I said, yes, she's rather piquant looking. And he said, piquant? And I said, yes, P-I-Q-U-A-N-T. And he said, what does that mean? Brene Ricard. I landed in that factory and I heard the voice of Andy Warhol, that very odd voice, almost like a ventriloquist. You had the feeling you had to put a coin into his mouth so he would say something, ultraviolet. The factory people to me were the scum of American society, a bunch of rich kids who could get away with it simply because they were rich kids. Matt Finkelstein.
and Edie in there just going on and people saying she's been doing this, you know, for three hours. She'd sit on a table and talk and sort of do stuff and laugh. I don't know. I guess it was my first real view of performance art. And I guess what I had seen a year or two ago at the Fisher's Island party was kind of a personal rehearsal, you know. Maybe became, she became aware of how it rather fascinated and attracted people and ended up doing it for the camera, with people more scripting it. Robin Sedgwick. I think that she was a bit brave in the way that she was a bit fearless to be in those movies. Looking back at me, looking at it then, we're getting very Proustian here. She had the most amazing and wonderful quality to live in the film frame, to live there, to breathe, to inhabit it. B.B. Hansen. To play the poor little rich girl in this movie, Edie didn't need a script. If she needed a script, she wouldn't have been right for the part. Andy Warhol. If all I cared about was me, I could make a million, and that's what they will never understand. Edie. You know, Andy as a director didn't exist. Andy turned on the lights or had Gerard or Paul turn them on. He thought that the setting was amusing or viable and let people carry on as they willed. Donald Lyons. All the movies with Edie were so innocent that when I think back on them, they had more of a pajama party atmosphere than anything else. Andy Warhol. You live alone, creating your life as you go. Edie. Edie was his greatest creation because he was about self-manufacture. Edie was his greatest doppelganger. Rene Ricard. Edie went with the factory, went with Andy very easily, dressed like Andy for a while, became the consort of Andy, became the girl Andy. Donald Lyons. This is what makes you crazy. The strength of her soul. The Warhol thing was like, they were lucky, that's all. They didn't create her. L.M. Kit Carson. There was a romance between the two, one of two artists, almost like two collaborators. B.B. Hansen. Edie and Andy had fun. They egged each other on, and I think Edie carried Andy into some kinds of situations. I mean, she wasn't his passport because he was the one who had been invited, or they had been invited together but it was nearly gleeful some of the time. I think they really had a good time for a while. Gordon Baldwin. She saw through what he was doing or what he was trying to use her for. Andy, there was a certain amount of resentment. Andy saw her as the have, Chuck Wine. I was not enthusiastic about it in the sense it was none of my business, but on the other hand, I thought at first it was exploitive on Andy's part, and then I changed my mind and decided it was exploitive on any part. Maybe it was exploitive on Edie's part. Then I thought, well, what the hell, they're two publicity seekers, attention seekers, and I guess they're binding up each other's wounds. Fred Everstadt. I act this way because that's the way I feel like acting. If people like it, fine. If they don't, that's their problem. Edie. Andy was very kind to Edie and to everybody. He never promised more than he could deliver. He was a film director and a photographer. He didn't promise a life to these people. He promised just the afternoon to them. Andy, insofar as he had a coherent philosophy, which is not very far, believed in seeing everybody and letting everybody run amok in filming them destroying themselves, and he didn't care. Donald Lyons. Andy didn't quite develop relationships with people, except with Edie. He liked people who were sort of vulnerable and needed help. He was so lame himself, and to him everybody was sort of better off than he was. So when he found a sort of lost soul, he sort of took a little interest, and I think he did that with Edie. Paul Morrissey. One person in the 60s fascinated me more than anybody I had ever known. And the fascination I experienced was probably very close to a certain kind of love. Andy Warhol. I think that Andy had a presence like that of a protective father, as an identity provider. This was all a construct of Edie's and of societies at the time. It was very unreal, and everyone knew it was unreal, and so did Edie. I don't think Andy pretended to be anything he wasn't. He pretended to be a let's go to the party that afternoon, wear that, don't wear that, cut your hair this way. So Edie is his latest demonstration. She was delighted and amused to be the fashion model, is too weak a word for it, the creature of Andy. But I don't think she knew it for more than it was, and I don't think Andy did. But there was no tomorrow for Edie. Donald Lyons. The essential thing about the whole Warhol world, and the reason I got out of it, I had to get out of it to save myself, is that Andy's a voyeur, and he needs exhibitionists around, which is all right, but he's also kind of a sadist. He's a voyeur sadist, and he needs exhibitionist masochists to, 
to, in order to fulfill both halves of his destiny. And it's obvious that an exhibitionist masochist is not going to last very long. You know, you go up in a fine burst of flames and then you die out. And then the voyeur sadist needs another exhibitionist masochist. Henry Geldzoller. I'm just saying, if worse comes to worse, you could always, you know, make a fortune of Edie going into the sea. She had the brights and the smarts and the instincts. She was going to sit on the ground and lean against it and put her legs up in the air. I don't want to take credit for any creativity on that. She kind of took over the whole photography session because Andy didn't say a word. I didn't think of her as a great beauty. I thought of her as a kind of vivacious and lively woman. I think she was attractive, but the thing that made her better is that when she made a room kind of come alive when she came in, because you know she and Andy used to go to parties kind of as a prop for a party. A party was considered a success if Andy, Wardle, Andy Warhol and Edie Sedgwick came in. Well, when they came in, Andy sort of, you never saw him at all after that, unless he was taking pictures with his Polaroid camera. Edie was the one that gobbled up the room with her energy. She really, as somebody said, she really could say hello. When she was with Andy, she reminded me of a Scott Fitzgerald lady, you know. She was alive, and she was able to put a party aspect on everything. So when we did this picture, she lit that thing up. She made it a picture. She made it an occasion. It was her spirit that set that shot up. Bert Glenn of the Sunday Times. It's not that she wanted the next party. She wanted the next joy. She wanted the next sense of fun. That was the feeling that she gave. Donald Lyons. The real Edie is where the action is. Fast cars, fast horses, and people doing things. Edie. Often the funniest things she said were inadvertent, like asking Salvador Dali what it was like being a famous writer. In retrospect, I wonder if she knew exactly who he was and wanted to tease him. In any event, he roared with laughter. In the year 2000, you're going to have a problem. Leisure time will be a problem in the year 2000. I just want you to realize, I just want to make sure that you know of it now. Edie. Life was a perpetual dance party. The great temptation about the factory was that it was a perpetual party in one place or another, so that there was an opportunity to endlessly experience the sense of life as a joy. I'm afraid of habit patterns. It would be too much of a routine if you had to establish definite ways of getting through things. You'd get very bored, Edie. What are your plans for marriage? Edie says, I am, there's only, you know, I can only marry one of four or three people. Who? The first and foremost, which might have to be the last, and uh, Mick Jagger. I think you just want to be the person who gets the moon. Edie, I'm already halfway there, and I didn't choose it either. He said, how would I like to shoot up some acid with him? And this is really mind-blowing. He was a new doctor. I had never met him before. I just got his name from a friend of mine. I used to get my drugs from another gynecologist, but since I was committed to Gracie Square, I couldn't get any of my old connections to get me anything. I hadn't had that much experience with acid, but I had hard drug experience, and I wasn't afraid. So he closed up his office at five, and we took off in his Aston Martin and drove up the coast or up the, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where we were headed, I think it was up the Hudson, and we stopped at a motel, and he gave me three ampules intravenously, mainlining, and he gave himself the same amount, and he completely flipped. I was hallucinating and explaining to him, you know, I'd say, I see rich embroidered curtains, and I see people moving in the background, but I realized I was hallucinating. He believed we were in the Middle Ages, and I was some kind of princess, and he was some kind of royalty, and we made love from about five in the afternoon till seven in the morning, and just going insane until he, re he realized he had to get to his office. He gave me a shot to calm me down, and I took about 14 Placidil, because I was so stoned I couldn't come down. And I was so afraid I had overdone it, and on the way back he straightened out very well, and I just, something very strange happened. I didn't realize I was going to say it, and I said out loud, I wish I was dead. And the reason I said it was the love and the beauty and the ecstasy of the whole experience was really an alien experience in a way, because I didn't even know him. It was a one-night jag. He was married and had children, and I just felt really lost. 
It just wasn't worth living anymore because I was all alone again. Edie. Somehow I believe in the magical sense of things. Do you think I could have a cigarette? Edie watching herself. Isn't that sad? I'm so fragile. It's tragic. Can you believe it? That's so sad. And then you'd look at that and see this flash. And then in retrospect, you'd see the shadow right behind the flash. And that's why the flash stands out so much. L.M. Kit Carson. When you'd see her with a straight man, it was always as if she was on a wild ride and she didn't know where she was going to land. Rene Ricard. Edie was promiscuous at times. She had this Scorpio moon sensual side that had nothing to do with relating to anybody. It was inner space, a sensual reality that's self-contained. Chuck Lyon. I remember her at some something and she had these scars and she had made them up to make a thing of them. I thought that was kind of a great approach to life, you know, to do that. Chase Mellon. Then they say, use it, channel it, do it. Like there will be a sign, be an artist, you're so creative, do anything. You've got to do it, use it. Then things like, and you've got to collect yourself too. I mean, you know, make your hair more about yourself, self-respect. But ridiculous. You know why my doctor got so mad this last time? He said that scene, remember in the LSD bit? The only time I had it sleeping with what's his name and having that sex bit go on a while. It was very strange mannered, but I certainly wasn't mortified. I mean, I humanly might be a little mortified knowing that a thousand other human beings would think it mortifying, but basically me. So he thought that was a total lack of self-respect, which is wrong, totally wrong, Edie. Absolutely staggeringly beautiful. You wanted to help her in any way you could. She had that quality drew upon your sympathies. George Plimpton. Iconic, as if she was some sort of figure. Madonna. It was as, as if she was some kind of an icon in that sense, and that all of that was going to explode, and she's acting out through all of that, about to fall off the altar and go into a thousand pieces. John Palmer. You knew that you couldn't really have her. Everybody knew that, that she was doomed. You just knew that. Danny Fields. Why would someone surround themselves with homosexuals and only feel safe with homosexuals? Rene Ricard. That was a dream. It's like my having to walk down thousands and thousands of white marble stairs and nothing but very, very blue sky, very blue. Yes, and I'd have to walk down them forever. I never thought about going up. I don't know, don't you think that must mean something? It never occurred to me to turn around. I mean, why didn't I think that way to turn it around? This was after I had the car accident. I don't know. I think I've run out of time. Edie. Judy Garland was definitely there. Edie looked beautiful that night, laughing a lot with Brian Jones, Juliet Prowse, who'd just broken up with Frank Sinatra, Tennessee Williams, Allen Ginsberg, and William Burroughs, Montgomery Clift. The stars went out and the superstars came in. There were more people staring at Edie than at Judy. But to me, Edie and Judy had something in common a way of getting everyone totally involved in their problems. When you were around them, you forgot you had problems of your own. You got so involved in theirs. They had dramas going around the clock and everybody loved to help them through it all. Their problems made them even more attractive. Andy Warhol. I say the word death a lot. Think of it as primal relations, opposite. So if I say death a lot, it means I'm concerned with life. Edie. I need to dance it out, Edie. She would do these sort of pirouettes with one leg raised and it was like no one else's dancing and her hands would somehow disconnect at the wrist. So it was a little bit like a praying mantis in a way, just the way she looked when she moved. Gordon Baldwin. Her dance moves were sort of Egyptian with her head and chin tilting in just the right beautiful way. People called it the Sedgwick and Edie was the only one who did it. Everybody else was doing the jerk. Andy Warhol. I lost all my jewels, including a $20,000 star sapphire, Edie. To Edie, money was like play money. She would blithely spend $500 for a set of false eyelashes at Bonavita, and she would be equally blithe spending $500 of her money for a luncheon party at the Ritz, Ed Hennessy. God, what she would steal, I would have to search her. I didn't have to, but after a while, there were so many little tchotchkes missing. It was like a frisk in an airport. Danny Fields. She showed me an after hours bootlegger where she could get Chateau Marmont. Seriously, she knew where to get caviar. 
She knew where to get the most expensive anything after hours. Nat Finkelstein. If she liked something, she'd buy two of them in every color. Chuck Lime. This doesn't interfere with the shopping, however. Money as cash didn't exist for her as a concept. It was my mother will come to New York and buy me a, an apartment and a leather rhinoceros from Abercrombie and Fitch. Daddy, or Danny Fields. Her solution to the problem was very odd and very expensive. She would order three or four entirely different dishes, all at full price. When they arrived, she would sample them and eat the one she liked best. Then she would visit the ladies' room and throw up. After that, she would return to the t table and eat another of the meals, and so on. She had lost her Mercedes. They took it away because it had so many tickets. Her father wasn't paying her credit cards anymore, and Ondine was being her maid, Billy name. Eventually she'd go, oh, this is so boring. Why do we have to do this now? The same bills are going to come next month. And everybody would say, yeah, you're so right. Later, let's have a veal marsala or something. And they'd scoop the unpaid bills all up and back in the envelope. Danny Fields. That would be the ritual. That would be paying the bills. You never paid them. You put them in piles. And she would say, what is this, shampoo? $47 for a bottle of shampoo? Danny Fields. She was the girl on fire, and I don't mean it literally, I mean it figuratively. She shimmered, she shone, and fame has so much to do with it, Renee Ricard. Edie was incredible on camera, just the way she moved, and she never stopped moving for a second, even when she was sleeping. Her hands were wide awake. The great stars are the ones who are doing something you can watch every second, even if it's just a movement inside their eye. She started to realize there was power in there, the muse. John Palmer and Andy Warhol. Even to people in England, she was a more easily understandable pop figure. I think what she was was to a regular girl, she represented something that they could understand in that movement. I mean, I couldn't understand Andy Warhol. I didn't understand any of those things. But I sure understood that she was gorgeous and she was wonderful and she was part of that big change that made everything more fun. Janet Palmer. As Edie got more famous, she totally changed, and the shimmer got stronger and stronger and stronger. Renee Ricard. Renee Ricard's rule of three. You can know somebody before they're famous, you can know someone while they're famous, and you can know somebody after they're famous, but you cannot know them all three times. So I knew Edie before she was famous, and I was making movies with her while she was famous, and then she vanished. Wherever I've been, I've been quite notorious. Edie. Edie was in some kind of clingy dress, and she looked very, very fetching. She was standing, and she said, Do you know these people here? And I said, Some of them, I guess. She said, I don't know anybody. Will you stay with me? And I said, Edie, what do you mean you don't know anybody? Everybody here knows who you are. It was remarkable, as if you went to the White House, and the president said, Stay with me. I don't know anybody here. Fred Erberstadt. There was an opening and Jackie Kennedy was there. They got Edie there and then they set it up. They had the photographers and all of that, like Edie was Andy's date or something. Edie had no clue. She was just going to the gig. Chuck Wine. But I realize that since I exist at all, I believe that it's possible for people. I've lived through impossible situations, so I believe in it. I just believe and that's the magic. That's the whole thing. You talk about magic that's there to believe in, and it is there. But most people don't really believe in it. And I refuse, since I'm still alive and done the things I've done and seen things and understood things as far as I have. And I am alive. I mean, I'm physically intact when I shouldn't be, according to medical reports and so forth. I mean, I shouldn't be here. That's all there is to it. So the magic's working, and it's a rare situation. You care enough that you want your life to be fulfilled in a living way, not in a painting way, not in a writing way. You really do want it to be involved in living, corresponding with other living objects, moving, changing, that kind of thing. Speed and booze, that gets funny. You get chattering about at about 50 miles an hour with a downdraft and booze to kind of cool it. It can get very funny, a little ridiculous. It can go into insane ravages. It kind of gets amused somewhere between insanity and a safety zone. It's a good combination for a party, Edie. Edie wasn't crazy in any way, shape, or form. Drugs would simulate madness, Renee Ricard. 
The whole speed ravage, that was something I was very much a part of, but at the same time I was conked out on God knows how many second all and two and all and a lot of barbiturates to kind of cool the ravages of speed, that incredible nightmare paranoia that drives human beings crazy. Edie. Tranquilizers, I think, do that. Put you in horizontal motion. Edie. Everybody would just be sitting there cooling their heels while Edie was obsessed, speeding her brains out, obsessed for hours and hours and hours on just her eye makeup. B.B. Hansen. When there were drugs, Edie was like a police dog. The Drug Enforcement Agency would have employed her to work airports. She was better than any dogs that I've seen in action. She just knew where the drugs were, and she took them. Danny Fields. She would take LSD because we had all the original LSD in my refrigerator in New York. Tommy and Chucky brought it down from Leary and the erstwhile Richard Alpert, who was producing this brown liquid that you put on a sugar cube with an eyedropper. One drop was enough to change the life of any living human being, and there must have been thousands of drops in those bottles. And that was in my fridge. Danny Fields. She was the very beginning of the whole unisex trip, Betsy Johnson. She was very tempted, and I gather Bob Dylan was very infatuated with her, as every living male in the history of the world was, Danny Fields. I never had that much to do with Edie Sedgwick. I've seen where I have had and read that I have had, but I don't remember Edie that well. I remember she was around but I know other people who might have been involved with Edie. Uh, she was a great girl, an exciting girl, very enthusiastic. She was around the Andy Warhol scene and I drifted in and out of that scene, but then I moved out of the Chelsea Hotel. We, me and my wife, lived on the third floor in 1965 or 1966 when our first baby was born. We moved out of that hotel maybe a year before Chelsea Girls and when Chelsea Girls came out, it was all over for the Chelsea Hotel. Bob Dylan. People were telling her that she should concern herself with being a very famous star, putting in her mind that she was the greatest thing since Greta Garbo or Marilyn Monroe. She owed it to herself to be that famous. She didn't know what to do. She really wanted some guidance very badly. She wanted a spiritual moment, and nobody gave it to her. Undine. She was just sort of saying, please don't do this. I'm going to go up to Woodstock. Mr. Grossman thinks I should be in a movie. They're planning for Bob Dylan to be in the movie and I'll be in the movie with him, Paul Morrissey. Everyone knew she was the real heroine of Blonde on Blonde, Patti Smith. I backed out of a film I was supposed to do for Andy Warhol. I refused to do it because I got scared. Some insane people from, what was the name of that university? Not Columbia, but they were quite insane. These people that were backing the film Anyway, the people broke into my apartment in the middle of the night and threatened me, and I had a police lock and two other locks, and they broke the door down, threatened me about the contract, and I was, you know, half out of it anyway, so he split and left the door splintered behind him. The contract was broken, and the star never appeared. Edie. Andy Warhol just realized she was kind of selfish when she said, please don't show my films anymore. Mr. Grossman thinks they'd be bad for my reputation now that I'm going to become a film actress which he thought was rather peculiar, since nobody was interested in her except once every four months. Somebody saw the film, and then somebody wrote about it for one day, and nobody even saw the films. They saw her picture in the magazines, thanks to Andy, Paul Morrissey. Albert Grossman was very shrewd, and Albert would want everything for himself. And if Albert was involved, he would have known about the films, and he might have told Edie to not show the films. Jerry Schatzberg. It was just the three of us, and Andy, for some strange reason, had heard that very day something that she didn't know, and he said, Edie, do you realize that yesterday or today Bob Dylan got married? And she sort of turned white. She was really surprised, so I don't know. I guess she had hoped for better connections to Dylan going up there. Who knows what she had in her head? Paul Morrissey. Man, that was a terrible night. Some little model had called to say she was at the airport and asked where she should go. Edie had taken the message from my answering service and she thought I was not being straight with her. She was in a fury. She burned her cigarette out in my face. It was at some club. I dragged her out into a limousine. Bob Newirth. It took me quite a few immature years of a lot of sex and a lot of pleasure and a lot of nothing, you know. And then I fell in love with someone 
it just completely blew my mind. It kind of drove me, drove me a little insane too. I was like a sex slave, and the minute he'd leave me alone, I felt so empty and so lost. I guess if I wasn't in the act of love making, I really enjoyed it. I really loved this man, but it didn't work out. The only true and passionate and lasting love scene ended in practically in the psychopathic ward, Edie. I tried to reach Edie on the phone in California. I pushed and probed, and after a while, it turned out she was sick and couldn't come to the phone. Finally, I discovered she was in a hospital. Well, listen, is she in a medical or a psychiatric ward? It turned out she was in the psychiatric ward. All very confusing. I knew she was not crazy or trying to kill herself. Edie's father finally came to the telephone. He seemed rather proud when he told me how he had committed her for her safety. I guess it was the only way they could think of controlling her. Hand out the job to a professional. If you can't get your windows clean, hire a window washer. I told him that I had several lawyers in Los Angeles. If she wasn't at home to answer the phone the next afternoon, I was going to get the lawyers, who were poised in Los Angeles, to rescue her. Her father tried to neutralize the situation by saying, well, please come out here, and if you can't afford it, I'll send you an airplane ticket. I remember saying that putting her in a psychiatric ward was so out of keeping with the Christmas spirit. Something I said worked. They let her come home. When I finally reached Edie on the phone, she called out to me, get me out of here, I'm a prisoner. Shortly afterwards, she was on a plane back to New York, where she arrived smiling and completely covering up the discomfort she had experienced at home. She had a certain American puritanical way of not letting her blues get in the way of her lifestyle. Bob Newarth. I really flipped out. Bob said, let's go to a party. They're having an underground movie, and I, being the underground Warhol, heiress, queen, star, socialite, blah. These underground filmmakers, I can't remember their names, were there making a film, and Bobby really wanted to go, and I had a bad scene with him. In the beginning, I pulled out a knife, and I wasn't going to let him out the door until he made love to me. I just get really dreadful. But we went, and I went through the scene. It was filmed, and I really was furious at Bobby. I said, now I'm going to leave this party. I'm fed up. He said, all right, because he met all the people he wanted to meet. So we got out into my limousine, and he said, where would you like to eat? And I thought I was going to explode. I screeched at him, why the hell can't you make up your own mind where we're going to eat? Why do I have to make all the decisions? I got madder and madder as we went along, because he didn't say another word. I was so furious that I pressed the button, rolled down the glass plate between the seats, and told the chauffeur that this man was molesting me and that he was a junkie. And then I was so horrified by what I said, so flipped out by that, I jumped out of the car in front of oncoming traffic. I got bruised, badly, badly bruised, but no broken bones, and I was at a total loss as to what to do. I mean, I was conscious, and I wasn't destroyed at all, and I'd done such a terrible thing. The hotel people carried me in, and Bobby carried me in, but I had to pretend I was unconscious because I couldn't comprehend the fact that I had tried to get him busted. I tried to hurt him seriously. He's the only person I've ever gotten violent about. Of course, I take out whatever violence comes into my system much more heavily on myself than on anyone else, but this was a pretty tight squeeze. If I hadn't jumped out of the car like a maniac, they would have carted him off on my word. I was a celebrity. I was in a much more powerful position than a shady Lower East Side character like Bobby Newarth, Edie. There was a sense of desperation, the way she was obsessed with him, and I can't say that he was really capable of containing that kind of falling apart from her and she tried everything she could to get him to love her she would buy him things she would do all kinds of things it was a painful relationship to watch you can understand it from a psychological point of view the object that isn't available the blueprint for love was associated with abandonment for her dominique robertson i remember him saying don't ask me to be a nursemaid i can't do it i can't take it richard leacock Anyway, we drifted apart. It started off with her mistreating herself. I couldn't believe that a person of such intelligence would mistreat herself to that extent, but I'm sure reflecting on it that, was, that it was caused by desperation and a lack of outlet for that incredible energy. Bob Newworth. I think she wanted to be out of control. L.M. Carson. I tried to bake a sweet potato and the oven exploded. It's not going to interfere with the film. I heal miraculously. I've been in an auto accident and another fire. They thought I'd need plastic surgery, but I haven't a scar. No, I don't think I'm accident prone, but it's strange. Edie. I heard about this doctor who gave vitamin shots, and they were very stimulating and kept you going for quite a while. I was under treatment with vitamin therapy, just multivitamin shots. 
but I heard about this super deal that this other doctor had. A guy I was going out with at the time told me not to go to him, never to have his shots. So I immediately took him, took them, thinking there must be something special about them. And there was. And I went. And that was the beginning of injecting drugs. I went to a doctor for it. I didn't handle it myself until a year later. I turned into a total speed freak for a few months. That's about as long as I could survive. And then I placed myself in the hospital. Edie. At the, that point in time, she was, a lot of these people were heavy into methadrine, alternating between B12 shots and methadrine. So we delivered the envelope and promptly watched her rig up an outfit, pull her bikini down, and jab her ass and shoot herself with some crank, some methadine. We're a couple of surfers from California, so our eyes are like saucers with this kind of stuff. Except Donna Hauer. I don't know what was in her mind as a plan for the future because it seemed to be pretty intense in the moment. I don't think she thought about the future. L.M. Kit Carson. It was a given that she was the classiest of all, most beautiful, the most glamorous, and you moved around her in that way. This was part of her persona. David Weissman. She had this sense of humor about herself and her situation. She saw her life as an open book, and she could laugh at every page. David Weissman. The whole place turned into a gigantic orgy, every kind of sex freak, from homosexuals to nymphomaniacs, especially the needle and mainlining scene, losing syringes down the pool drains and blocking up the water infiltration system with broken syringes. Oh, it was really some night, drinking, guzzling tequila, vodka, scotch, bourbon, and shooting up every other half second, and just going into an incredible tailspin. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Couldn't get enough of it. It was one of the wildest scenes I've ever been in or ever hoped to be in, and I should be ashamed of myself. I'm not, but I should be. Edie. I have an accident about every two years, and one day it won't be an accident. Edie. Burning up money, burning up cigarettes, burning up your mind, burning up traces, your footsteps, burning up the place she lives, the Chelsea Hotel, you know, burning up, ultraviolet. She lived in a brownstone underneath or above Jeff Gates, who was an old friend. She let herself on fire there. She was smoking, and she was always dropping cigarettes around. George Plumpton. I didn't know anything about it. Somebody said, oh, she set fire to the hotel. You know, come on. I was the first Chelsea girl who lived at the Chelsea. I saw so many fires there. I was there the night Jim Morrison set fire to a redhead's hair with a bottle of cognac. Renee Ricard. She lost her cat in that fire, too. And it was a cat that Bob Dylan had given her, Danny Fields. Sure enough, it wasn't long before the room burned and she managed to just get out by crawling along the floor in the burning room and reaching for the metal doorknob. When I brought Leonard Cohen in to meet her at the Chelsea, she had been shopping or shoplifting with her you never knew. She bought candles and arranged them on the non-working mantel. She and Bridget were in some kind of a let's pace sequence upon a manama until it's covered in sequins and whatever, part of their afternoon activities. Leonard Cohen said, this woman is in great danger. And I said, why do you say that? And he said, that's particular arrangement of candles, some African or voodoo or Kabbalah or whatever, I don't know. It could just have been Leonard. He knew a woman before he met her, any woman. He said, this is very unlucky. She should change it around. And she just laughed it off as I've heard some stupid superstitions in my time. Danny Fields. I feel guilty. One didn't know what to do with this incredible charm and life force and willingness to live and cleverness at seizing what is beautiful in life. She was becoming the Edie Cedric of the day. There had been nothing like it. Donald Lyons. Mind you, I had a life, I had a career, we all did, and so didn't have time to be with her at all times. She stayed on the high plane. The rest of us ascended there. Life on the high plane left her finally abandoned. Donald Lyons. She leads you sort of on a Dante-esque tour of the lower depths. George Plumpton. As she got older, the recklessness got stronger, and it really would have been far more brave for her to try to do otherwise than what she was doing. But she gave in. She was the opposite of brave. She let the tide carry her along, and the tide was a destructive one, and she became a smaller and smaller speck, and she simply let herself be swept along in its flow. Robin Sedgwick. There wasn't anything like that for her out there. There wasn't somewhere to go. There wasn't someone to be. There was just the moment. And that need to try to bring it all inside of her to fill the void. Robin Sedgwick. 
She came up to me in Gracie Square like a little orphan, like a beautiful little girl in this hospital gown and just looking bruised in every way and trembling and just said hello with those big eyes. It was like her sadness or her misery transcended any setting or any drug or anything. She didn't look like she had a place to go back to or a place to have another chance. Libby Titus. There were so many people ODing at the Chelsea or dying in a fire or jumping off the roof that it was like an endless stream of loss in the 60s. And so they all blend into one feeling of what's going on. Why are all these people ending like that? Drugs were a big part. They were basically the biggest part. I remember Andrea Whips and she was every night at the round table at the back of Max's. And I remember her saying to me, you are so lucky you never were in an Andy Warhol movie. Well, I was never in an Andy Warhol movie because I was too shy to appear in front of a camera. But she said it in a strange way. And a few days later, she jumped off a balcony of her mother's apartment on Park Avenue. So it was a mixture of exposing yourself and taking drugs and wanting to be loved by Andy Warhol, be the only one, you know, or by Jimi Hendrix, like this young woman who overdosed at the Chelsea. I was told to take care of her, but you know, who can take care of people who are in that situation? Larissa. By the end of the 60s, the rate of attrition was really showing up. A lot of people didn't make it. It was a great party, but not everybody made it to mourning. B.B. Henson. I remember my father telling me, Edie can't help being fucked up. Bad things happen to Edie. B.B. Henson. The first thing you saw when you walked into Max's Kansas City was a Chamberlain car wreck, squashed, and then standing next to it, Edie Sedgwick sort of rotating on an invisible pedestal. Two symbols of destruction. Danny Fields. She had such a gift for expression for being alive. Who knows what she would have been able to do. It was a doubtful future. Donald Lyons. At that time, she was like on Mo on Mars. Except Donna Hauer. The 60s, you know, we started out dancing through the daisies and running over the green hills and you were looking over your shoulder and there were a couple, couple bodies dropping. Pretty soon you were running for your life through broken glass and there were scary people chasing you. Jeff Briggs. She'd dress up in her soul as a hippie to be able to experience that as if it were a fashion, but it's not essentially who she is. There's something deeper that she's working on, John Palmer. She compressed an awful lot of life into a short period of time, so by the time we get to the end, she's used up a lot, John Palmer. She was a chameleon, you know, that's the first impression. She was very good at the first impression thing, but then she was different things to different people, Janet Palmer. I melted on the smile, and then once I was able to get eye contact with her, then I knew I was going somewhere. Her eyes just, they opened up. I mean, they opened up to me. Michael Post, Edie's husband. Some people search hard, you know. They search. You can search with nature. You can search with your mind. You can search with your body. You can search with chemicals. You can search. And that's what we're talking about. Is that the dynamo, the engine that makes things move? Some people search and they search tough, they search hard, they search with their body. There's hunger, there's anger, there's angst, there's thirst. And a person like Edie is given every benefit of that whole generation, of that whole nation in conquest and in victory. And yet there has to come an, epi an epigee. You get as high as you can and you can't get any higher and you're on the cusp of consciousness. Edward D. Romagna. The car I drove back then was this 1955 Mercedes-Benz 300 SL. They called it a Gullwing. It was like the ultimate dream car of its era, and Edie and I would drive back to the house, and we'd get into this whole routine. She'd say, David, could we have the cars open? And I'd say, Edie, you know it's going to happen. Oh, but it's so fun, and I love the wind. I'd succumb, then we'd zip along the freeway with our, door, our doors open like wings until the cops pulled us over. They'd search her, search me, search the car. She'd be giggling. They'd ask, what's so funny? And I'd say, nothing is funny, officer. Edie'd giggle like crazy when I was doing this. It was dangerous. It was pushing the limits in a very freakish way. When you drove the Gullwing with the doors open, you had this sensation, especially above 65 miles an hour. At what point are we going to take off? David Wiseman. I don't think Edie had too many secrets. She had forgot forgotten what her secrets were. Janet Palmer. Even in her most far out sort of state, 
She had tremendous appeal. That's what was so incredible about her, is that she could be really spaced beyond belief, and she could still put a sentence together that would blow your brains out, that one-upsmanship kind of a thing. Michael Post. In December 1970, we began filming the color footage in Santa Barbara. I asked Roger Vadim to play the doctor. He drove up with his, Paul, with his pal, Christian Marcand, the two of them flirting with Edie during the shoot, a whole routine. These two debonair French directors enthralled with Edie and she enthralled with them. But it took a turn where Edie really felt that Vadim and her had reached an understanding. He'd just broken up with Jane Fonda and Edie somehow saw herself as his next muse. Bridget Bardot, Catherine Deneview, other great European beauties of the mid 20th century. Vadim was the Casanova of his era. He clearly saw something in Edie. So there was a day trip out to see him in Alibu. I remember him asking, David, do you think Edith likes cracked crab? Vadim always believed Edie just needed a little bit of love. All through the color shoot, Edie kept asking, when is Vadim coming? The night she went home with him, I got the phone call at 3 a.m. from Vadim. Can you come and collect Edith? It's a bit much. I sent Michael Post. David Weissman. They liked her, but then they got scared. There was too much of her that was disturbed for people. Janet Palmer. You'd look around in the lifeboat, and you could pick out, yeah, you know this girl probably ain't gonna make it. You could kind of pick her out. It was sad as hell. It was sad as hell. Jeff Briggs. I used to fight with her about pills because I used to always find that she hadn't taken them, which I think killed her in the end. She used to save them up. And then if she liked me that day, she'd say, I'm going to take a lot of pills today. And I would go in like four times in the night and check that she hadn't died. Janet Palmer. Because we were always afraid, of course, that she would slit her wrists We'd been warned by her shrink and the previous nurse, no razor blades, that she would attempt suicide. John Palmer. I guess I should call this the Siege of the Warwick, but left alone with a substantial supply of speed, I forgot that I was heavily addicted to barbiturates, and I started having strange convulsive behavior. This was after I was done, while I was shooting up every half hour, every 20 minutes on the half hour thinking with every fresh shot I'd knock this nonsense out of my system, this physical disability I be began to notice, namely convulsions, which lasted eight hours, during which I entertained myself while hanging on to, head down, hanging on to the bathroom sink, with my hind feet stomped against the drawer, trying to hold myself steady enough so I wouldn't crack my stupid skull open. I entertained myself by doing a tape and making up five female voices, all different personalities, a really fabulous tape. I can't remember the details of it now, and it was lost in one of my fires, but it was quite brilliant, I think. At the end of it, when I realized that I had to get barbiturates in order to stop the convulsions, something was zingy in my head. I just kept thinking, if I pop enough speed, I'll knock the daylights out of my system, and then none of this nonsense will go on. None of this flailing around the room and sweating like a pig, and it was a heavy scene, and when I finally cooled down to an extent where I thought I was calm and cool and collected, far be it from the reality, but comparatively, I was in pretty good shape. So I flipped on a little moo, moo ran down barefoot, taking the stairs to the lobby, and my eye caught a mailman's jacket and then a sack of mail in the hallway. And before I knew what I was doing, I whipped on the jacket, flipped the bag over my shoulder, and flew out the door, whistling a happy tune, got halfway around the block, and suddenly I thought, my God, this is a federal offense, fooling around with the mail. So I turned around and rushed back, and bam, the manager was there, and he just ordered me in the back office. And so I began to articulate it as cautiously as I could, and inquire as to what I might be able to be held for. Not one of them would answer me. They telephoned an ambulance from Bellevue, packed me into it, five policemen. I wasn't much of a match against them, and was rushed to Bellevue, which is one of the most insane institutions I have ever walked the hallways of. I proceeded to tell the doctors while I was back in convulsions again, which was really a drag, and I proceeded to tell all the attending doctors and nurses and students that I was heavily addicted to speed and barbiturates, but I'd run out of barbiturates and I'd overshot speed, so I was in this state of convulsion. I could speak sanely, but I behaved. All my motor nerves were going wild, crazy, flipped out, insane motions, so I looked like I was out of my mind. If you just listened to what I had to say, it was sane, but if you looked at me, you wouldn't bother to listen, and none of them did. Oh God, it was a nightmare. 
Finally, about six big attendants came then and held me down and put me on a stretcher, and they just terrified me, just their force against me, and I got twice as bad. I just flipped, and I told them if they just let go of me, I could calm down. I could stop kicking and fighting and being so terrified, but they wouldn't listen. And then they started this nightmare, telling each other what I was going through, what stages of hallucination I was in, how I imagined myself an animal. All these things totally unreal to my mind and just guesses on their part. It was insane. And then they plunged a great big needle into my butt and I was out for two whole days unconscious. It was one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever been through. It was like she could just see, just out of her reach, she could see how it could have been her. How what she could offer, the fine quality of what she thought she was capable of. Jeff Briggs. I haven't been in love with anyone in years and years, but I have a certain amount of faith that it'll come. Part of her existence is a deeply poignant and sad, very mature understanding of her own permanent unrequitedness that she's yearning for in a deeply profound and sincere way. She would allude to the fact that love was something that, was, that would be pleasant, that she'd be looking forward to the idea of love. John Palmer. Here's the thing, and it was clear as a bell, it didn't have to be that way. Fate is not written in stone the day you're born, but somehow she was on that path and she wasn't getting off. But if you really watched her, sometimes she'd look over and it was almost like she was giving you a wink or a glint, like a little high side. The significance that she realized the spot she was in and she was playing that role. Jeff Briggs. We talked about having kids, and as a matter of fact, she thought she might even be pregnant there at the very end. And it was kind of like, well, we've kind of tried a number of things. Maybe a child would bring us closer together. And you know, I'm into my late 20s now, Michael, and maybe it's time for me to have kids, if I can, at this point. Michael Post. There were times that I was totally convinced that Edie was in love with me. I think she wanted me to be kind of a nursemaid, a lover, a boyfriend, a father, a brother, a husband. You know all of those things, but I was incapable of it because I wasn't her brother, and I wasn't her father, and I wasn't her psychiatrist, and I wasn't a number of those things. But she wanted me to be, and I just couldn't fill all those roles for her. That led to problems, and then the frustration, and then of course the quick escape. Let's get loaded, forget about it. Michael Post. That last night, I can't remember exactly if she said, we're not going to be together much longer, or I don't think we're going to be together much longer, or maybe even I don't want to be, you know, I think we're going in different directions, or we're not both going in the same direction. Words to that effect. That hurt me, and I thought, okay, I guess to save a little face or something, you know, how your ego will kind of kick in. It's like, okay, sure, I get you. I bring you back to fame and fortune, and this is my, this is my gratitude I get for it. I didn't think this was going to happen to her, what happened to her. I thought she was a major soul, L.M. Kit Carson. It was sad but not shocking. There was something about Edie that said, this is a one-act play, it's not going to go on forever. When I knew her, she was not of this earth. She was indeed never of this earth. She was born of madness and suffering and declined into madness and suffering. But she had a period when the sun shone for her when life was smiling, and she was smiling with it.